Hi, I'm Gavin with Thought Process. Have you ever wondered, WTF is an ETF? Well, maybe your language wasn't quite that strong, but for some, exchange-traded funds are still a bit of a mystery. This free webinar is about 30 minutes, and like all of my webinars, you will get some good information, I'll give you some uh, ideas on where to go from here, and hopefully you'll have a few chuckles. So let's head over to my computer and talk about exchange traded funds. Okay, so WTF is an ETF, the low down on exchange traded funds, hype or hope. So in this webinar, we're going to cover what is an index, the birth of an index fund, how a mutual fund works, how an exchange traded fund works, how mutual funds charge, you guessed it, how an ETF charges, uh, exchange traded fund flavors and ETF companies, when ETFs can be handy, and some Q&A for our Canadian uh, watchers out there. So, uh, a brief history of exchange traded funds. Let's kind of start with the index and see how that all got started. So in the beginning, there was this guy, Charles Dow, and he had this thing called the Wall Street Journal that he created and he was the chief editor and he wanted to know, how can I sell more newspapers? So what he decided to do was come up with a way to give people a reason to buy the paper every day and check out a number. So what he did was he took initially 12 stocks. Some of them were things like American cotton oil, American sugar, US leather. And with all of these stocks, he took the value of the 12 stocks and then started with some number, say 40. You know, how did he come up with 40.94? I have no idea. But what he did do was um, take those 12 stocks, figure out each day how much they changed in price, and then you could just look at a number and know how those 12 stocks did with the idea that if those 12 stocks went up, chances are the market went up. So he called it the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, or the Dow is what it kind of became uh, known as over time. And eventually the 12 stocks was uh, expanded to a list of 30 stocks. So rather than look at the 30 stocks, you could just look at what the Dow is at every day. And if the Dow is up, chances are the entire market of stocks is up. And if it, the Dow is down, the market's down. So Charles started the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the first index, as a way to get people to buy more newspapers. So over time, other companies got in on this index action. And this became more popular after the Second World War. So, for example, Standard & Poor's, uh, a company that rates other companies and provides research, they wanted to have an index so people would follow their index every day and they figured, well, 30 stocks isn't enough, let's pick 500 stocks. So they came up with the Standard & Poor's 500, which we know is the S&P 500, and same thing just like the Dow. You can track the S&P, if it's up, probably the market is up, and so forth. So now, this index starts to get power. Let's say you manage a mutual fund, and your mutual fund buys and owns and trades stocks similar to what's in the US stock market or the S&P 500. So what'll happen is you run this mutual fund, and depending on how you do relative to the index, determines whether you get a bonus. So if you beat the S&P 500, you might get a bunch of money. If you don't, maybe you don't get as much. So over time, this index becomes very important to a lot of mutual fund managers' paychecks. And so um, they're obviously trying to beat the index. But if you do a little bit of Googling and research, you'll find that 
you know, maybe on average 10% of fund managers can do better than the S&P 500. So the idea that if you can't beat them, um, back in 1993, a company called State Street came up with something called the S&P Depository Receipt, uh, or the Spider. It's cute marketing. They added the I in there. And what the Spider is, is um, like a mutual fund, but it's not a mutual fund. It owns and tracks the S&P 500. So it, uh, whatever stocks are in the S&P 500 in whatever amounts, the spider has that as well too. Now we'll get into how a mutual fund is priced and so forth. This is different from a mutual fund because it trades on an exchange. Uh, and the first exchange to have uh, um, an exchange traded fund was the American Stock Exchange or the Amex. And they had a cute little logo as well too. So that was the first index fund or exchange traded fund back in 93. And so let's now get into how ETFs work. So basically what happens is there's um, a, with a mutual fund, a mutual fund company and then the mutual fund. So the mutual fund owns a bunch of stocks, stock A, stock B, stock C, and then there's um, a, a unit price. So what happens is the mutual fund tallies up the value of all the stocks it owns, divides it by the number of units and says, okay, on Monday, uh, if you buy one unit of the fund, it's $14.22. Now there's you. So the mutual fund company says if you want to buy a unit, it costs $14.22. So you decide to buy a unit in the mutual fund. The mutual fund goes out and buys all these stocks in order for you to own a unit. So by you buying a unit in the mutual fund, the mutual fund has to buy all those stocks. And so uh, they actually go out in the market and then buy those. So the flip side happens is when you want to sell your fund, you tell the mutual fund company that you want to sell your unit. They have to sell all those stocks to get cash to give you $14.22. So by buying and selling mutual fund units means the mutual fund company has to buy or sell shares or whatever the mutual fund owns, uh, either to use your cash if you're buying it or to get you cash if you're selling. So how does an exchange traded fund work? A little bit similarly, but with a few differences. So take an um, exchange traded fund company and ETF company like iShares, they're huge. So what iShares does is they look at what's listed in the Dow. So they look at the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones and then what they do is they create an index fund based on what's in the Dow Jones. So iShares doesn't need to hire anyone to think about picking stocks or deciding what they should or should not own. They just let Dow Jones decide what is going to be in the index and they just go ahead and provide a fund that tracks the Dow Jones and owns the stocks in the Dow Jones. So from there, what happens is iShares first creates these things called creation units, which it keeps. So the creation units owns stock A, stock B, stock C, whatever is in the Dow. And let's say that's $100,000. So it creates $100,000 worth of these units. Then what it does is it then creates shares which own the creation units and tracks the creation units. So they create $100,000 of these units, which then they create $100,000 worth of exchange traded fund shares, ETF shares. 
and then those ETF shares will trade in the stock market. The creation units don't go anywhere. They're not bought or sold. They're not traded. They're just held on the side. It's the ETF shares which represent the creation units that trade back and forth in the stock market. So on most days, you and I will trade these shares back and forth. So depending on what the creation units are worth, the ETF shares should be worth what the creation units are worth. So through supply and demand, if the Dow is going up, our shares will be going up because otherwise if they weren't going up I could just buy the 30 shares in the Dow so the share price of the exchange traded fund is always being corrected changed by the second by the microsecond to reflect what the index is doing so how a mutual fund is priced is at the end of the day so during the day, the mutual fund price does not change. At the end of the day, the market closes, the mutual fund company adds up the value of all the stocks and says, okay, now that the market is closed, you can buy this mutual fund anytime before tomorrow at market close and you'll pay $14.22. So a mutual fund is priced after the market closes. An exchange traded fund is priced all day long. So whereas a mutual fund is priced after the market closes, an ETF is priced only while the market is open. So after the market closes, the last trade for the ETF is no different than the last trade on a share in any stock. So all day long, those ETF shares are trading back and forth between you and me and whoever and the price is being set all the time while the market's open. So that's the major difference between ETFs and mutual funds is when their prices change. So ETFs trade just like stocks. Here's an example of um, this is the SPY the uh, the spider s p etf uh the symbol is spy the the, the s p etf um and it generally is one tenth of the s p 500. so if the s p 500 is at 1600 the spy should be about 160 roughly so it's about one tenth so uh, in this case, there's a bid in the ask, just like a stock. So right now, investors are willing to buy SPY for 166.10, and some investors are willing to sell for 166.11. So there's a penny spread in between the bid and the ask, okay? Just like a stock. Uh, you can see how many lots a lot is a hundred shares so there's 5300 shares bid at 166.10 4500 shares at ask at 166.11 uh, and you can see the last trade was 166.11 and the volume is 58 million shares so quite a few shares of SPY have traded on this particular day so yeah, you can see the symbol, the bid, the ask, and the volume. So when demand changes, what happens is um, the if there's more shares demanded than what is um, available, then what happens is the ETF company creates more units. So rather than offer a hundred thousand units or hundred thousand dollars worth of units they offer five hundred thousand worth of units then they'll have five hundred thousand worth of ETF shares so there's just simply more shares available to be bought okay and then they'll have to go out and buy more shares of the underlying stocks to satisfy this five hundred thousand 
So then those shares, there's more shares available to be bought and sold. So the ETF company has to buy more stock, it makes more creation units, and then it can make more ETF shares. So remember, when you're trading anything in the stock market, you need a buyer if you want to sell. So you can't just sell it to, into thin air. If you want to sell your ETF shares, you need me to buy them from you or vice versa. So what can happen, here's an example. Um, this is an ETF that tracks the Australian dollar. So if the Australian dollar goes up, this thing goes up, Australian dollar goes down, it goes down. Now the bid is $10.01, the ask is 1003. There's uh, 6600 offered at 1001. There's 266 offered at 1003. Now look at the volume. There was no volume traded. So if you wanted to sell these things, there nobody has traded them today. So what can happen is the ETF company might make a market. So in fact, maybe there's nobody wants to buy these things. The ETF company says, okay, if you want to buy, we will buy them from you at 1001. Um, sorry, 1003. If you want to sell them, we will give you 1001. So they have a bit of a spread and they will actually buy the shares from you themselves to make a market. But they're not obligated. So if you own these things and Horizon says, nope, we don't want them, then you can't sell them to anybody unless you want to sell them at a lower price and there's someone willing to pay it. So how do ETFs charge? Now this will relate to why the ETF company wants to make more units. Remember a couple of slides ago I said maybe if demand for the ETF is higher, um, rather than have $100,000, they might have $500,000. And you might think, why does the ETF care? Uh, why do they want to have more shares? So let's first look at how mutual funds charge. So generally speaking, um, a mutual fund will charge 1% that goes to the advisor's firm. So you're dealing with a financial advisor, they get 1%. Another 1% goes to the mutual fund company. And then there's expenses such as accounting, legal, glossy brochures. Maybe that makes a 0.21%. So when you add this all up, the mutual fund charges 2.21%. So each year on your $100,000, you're paying $2,221 to the mutual fund company. Win, lose, or draw. It doesn't matter whether you make money or not. They take $2,221. Okay, that's how a mutual fund works. Now, an exchange traded fund, the ETF company, rather than charge 1%, they don't need as many people. They don't need all these expensive, smart people making buying and selling decisions. They can probably run this fund for 0.4 instead of 1. Now, they have expenses, but their expenses are lower. They don't have fancy, glossy brochures. They don't do all these things that mutual fund companies do. They have accounting and legal, that's about it. So the management expense ratio is not 2.21, it might be 0.51. So each year on your $100,000, you might spend $500 on fees, which is obviously a lot less than the mutual fund. So why does this matter? Costs matter a lot over time. Let's say a mutual fund and an ETF both make 7% a year before fees. After 30 years, the mutual fund, your $100,000, is worth just over 400000 
your exchange traded fund is worth <laughs> yes cha-ching is worth over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars so that's a big difference in fact um, I, I would highly recommend you watch uh, the frontline piece called the retirement gamble uh, I think it's about 30 or 40 minutes uh, we have a link on our website and I, I did a blog on this video so I really recommend it they get into the difference of fees and costs and how it can impact your retirement so check that one out it's a it's a good little video so there's lots of different flavors uh, for your ETF appetite there are ETFs that invest in what we consider the broad market like the Dow Jones Industrial Average the S&P 500 the Nasdaq 100 this is the biggest hundred stocks that trade on the Nasdaq uh, you can get um, ETFs that track the TSX composite on the Toronto Stock Exchange you can get ETFs that track emerging markets Russia China India Brazil uh, Mexico Argentina you name it you can get ETFs that track uh, markets in Europe um, such as you know uh, in London Germany uh, France so forth Asia all the various countries in Asia that have stock exchanges will have an index and you can buy an ETF on those indices you can buy ETFs that track sectors healthcare technology oil services there's tons of others consumer discretionary consumer staples um, gold mining you name it there's lots of ETFs that can track fixed income government bonds corporate bonds junk bonds uh, there's ETFs that track various types of commodities um, a big index is the Commodity Research Bureau index the CRB and that tracks you know wheat and energy and metals and pork bellies and whatever you can get an ETF that tracks that you can get ETFs that track gold and silver prices such as GLD or SLV you can get ETFs that are basically actively managed or have certain strategies you can buy an ETF that owns just dividend paying stocks or some ETFs are actively managed just like a mutual fund so there's a bunch of different ETF companies um, some in Canada are like iShares, Horizons, Bank of Montreal is a big ETF provider. Uh, in the States, Vanguard is huge. There's another one called Market Vectors. And because all these ETFs trade on an exchange, with mutual funds, you have to live in the country that the mutual fund is offered. So you might take a big mutual fund company like Fidelity they have mutual funds for Canadians and they have mutual funds for Americans Americans cannot buy the Canadian funds and Canadians cannot buy the American funds so if you've heard of a popular mutual fund like Fidelity Magellan for US investors Canadians cannot buy it ETFs are different because ETFs trade on exchanges Canadians can buy Vanguard Canadians can buy market vectors um, American investors can buy horizons or BMO if they want to because they trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange ETFs can be really handy for small investors for example let's say you're gonna buy some drug stocks and you're trading with a discount broker and let's say you're gonna buy Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Merck, Bristol Myers, Abbott. With a discount broker, you're going to have to pay $29 to buy each one. So what is that? Like $150, $145. So you buy all five stocks, that's going to cost you $145. Or you can buy the IHE, the iShares Dow Jones US Pharmaceuticals ETF. Wow, that's a mouthful. 
but that ETF owns all of those stocks. And if those stocks are going up, the ETF is going up. So good enough. And you only have to pay one commission of $29. ETFs can also really be handy for um, bonds and buying fixed income. Let's say, for example, you want to buy a government bond and you call up your stockbroker and he calls his bond desk. Uh, bonds are sold. They're not sold on an exchange. They're sold company to company, dealer to dealer. And he says to you, OK, if you want to buy this bond, we'll sell it to you for one hundred twenty three dollars. If you want to sell us this bond, we'll buy it from you for 121. And the annual interest is three bucks. Okay. So the difference between 123 and 121, that two dollars, is called a spread. That's the difference between what they will sell it to you and what they will buy it back from you. Think about this you're going to pay a $2 spread. Let's say you buy this bond for 123 and 8 months later you sell it back to them for 121. When the annual interest is $3, that spread is basically 8 months worth of interest. So if something happens and you have to sell this bond, you don't make any money for the first 8 months in a way. Think of it this way. This ETF would charge you about 44 cents a year to own this fund. So um, if you're going to own this uh, bond for less than four or five years, roughly, you're better to buy the ETF. If you buy this bond and keep it two years, it'll cost you two bucks. If you buy this ETF and keep it two years, it'll cost you 88 cents. For this reason, when I even used to trade for clients, I would use um, ETFs for fixed income for this very reason. So let's get into some Q&A. These are some questions that I came up with. If you have some questions, email those to us or make a comment at the bottom of this uh, webinar and then I will update it and answer your questions. So here's a question. Can my financial advisor buy these for me? So the answer is in Canada, the advisor needs to be something called IROC licensed, a stock broker. Because ETFs trade on a stock exchange, you need to be securities licensed in order to buy and sell ETFs. So your next question might be, what's an IROC? Well, um, the best thing I can recommend is check out my webinar, Choosing a Financial Advisor, the must-have guide for Canadians. And it's only nine bucks. I get into all kinds of stuff when it comes to financial advisors, including uh, licensing, who governs them or watches over them, and all that kind of fun stuff. So have a peek at that. Um, another question, can I buy ETFs on my own? You bet. Um, you do need to set up a discount brokerage account uh, because I mentioned they do trade like stocks. Uh, can I buy ETFs in my RSP or tax-free savings account? This is obviously something for Canadians. Um, yes, uh, most exchange-traded funds are treated like stocks, and they can be held in registered accounts, including a retirement savings plan, a retirement income fund, a locked-in retirement account, uh, a tax-free savings account, uh, or a registered education savings plan. How do I buy the right ones for me? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, you have a couple of options. You could either hire a financial advisor and she's going to ask you a bunch of questions and find out what you like and what you don't like and your goals and objectives and she's done her homework as well too. So you could either get um, an, an IROC adv advisor, a licensed advisor to help you with that or uh, 
take a look at my uh, trading mentor program. Uh, in the program, I'll teach you how to trade whatever you want, including exchange traded funds. So have a peek at that. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this webinar on ETFs. And uh, you definitely make uh, Charles and I happy if you like this webinar. Thanks for reminding me, Chuck. And enjoy your ETFs.